So first, let's talk about the economy. Strange cycle, most unique cycle any of us have ever lived through. Again, a one in 400 black swan. There is no doubt that when we look back on this cycle, the history books will have chapters for our children to read about, just like we read about the 1930s growing up. It is such a strange environment to deal with. Uneven, hesitant, choppy, inconsistent, I put whatever descriptor you want on it. The fundamental issues around this economic cycle is that the structural imbalances were so severe that they take time and they take policy and behavioral changes to drive the adjustment. Now don't get me wrong, there are some pluses out there. So for instance, in the US, we see very good performance and improvement in the private sector. Balance sheets are as healthy as they've been in the last 20 years. We're seeing the same thing as we're building this, this sort of comparable lenses in the UK and in Germany. But don't lose sight of the fact that this is a process. The excesses were so severe, so severe, that generally it takes 10 years to clear those excesses. I'll show you housing in a moment in the US and the UK. Suffice it to say, we had a great time. We had a really, really good time. Unfortunately, the price came due. Challenges we have as we go through this process is that we continue to get hit with headwinds. And we shouldn't underestimate the fact that while 2014 will be better in all likelihood than 2013, and we anticipate we will see continuous movement upward, don't lose sight of these headwinds and be prepared for them. Because there are big issues with a fragile recovery on a number of fronts. Two, I would encourage you to keep your eye on. One is what happens in terms of central banking policy, and the second one is what happens in emerging markets who are facing short-term financial pressures and long-term structural issues. Those are the two elements that keep us up at night in terms of our planning. If you think the ECB or the Bank of England or the Fed have a roadmap of where they're gonna go in the next two to three years, you're kidding yourself. The Bank of England just this week is spinning around trying to figure out what their communication plan is. No, 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 we're not going to target against the unemployment right now. We're going to look at a more systematic way of gauging when we make a policy change. Now that's the right answer. But think about the fact that they're tying themselves up in knots a bit because they're struggling with where they go, how fast they adjust. So bring this all together, it is a tough environment. If you want to get a sense for the severity of this downturn, let's look at global GDP over the last few cycles. So if you look at peak to trough, the downturn around the first Arab oil embargo we thought was as severe as it would get. The double digit downturn of 1980 and 82, which was the run up in interest rates, the uh, very aggressive policies from the central banks, including the Fed, and then the more recent downturn. So if you look at that drop in global economic activity peak to trough, almost five points in the downturn around the first Arab oil embargo. Here was the drop in 8082. I'm from Detroit, Michigan originally. This was traumatic. Unemployment rates in Detroit, Michigan got to 22%. For anybody keeping track, I remember that because I was just going into university and worried about whether or not I'd ever find a job. But look at this downturn. Severe. And then the other elements of the severity of this downturn has been the hesitant upward movement and then the subsequent stalling in some parts of the world and certainly in Europe. My best advice anytime you see a pattern, as you're seeing in this cycle, is to pause a moment and ask some basic questions because it's not a normal economic cycle. So ask some questions about why. Ask questions about what it means. Ask questions about the factors behind it so you can plan for the future going forward. As I mentioned, the downturn has been very uneven and choppy. If you look at growth 2000 to 2007 and then compare 2008 to 2014, look at the major developed economies, growing at less than one-third the rate of growth. The U.S., we celebrate 2% GDP growth. That's like me celebrating the fact that I'm tall. You can laugh about it, it's okay. 2%. In Europe, we've gone through a secondary contraction in parts of Europe, and now we're talking about the Eurozone growing at 1%, and that's dominating the headlines in the Financial Times that there's been this major economic turnaround. 
Emerging markets have bucked the trend a bit, and I'll discuss that a little bit further in a moment. But even there, there's been less robust growth, and of course, more recently, there's been question marks about the sustainability of growth. So you wonder why this happened. So let's talk about the factors behind this downturn to help understand where things could head in the future. I always like to call out sectors that were drunk and disorderly because they give you real insights about the magnitude of the problem. So what we've done is we've indexed home prices in the US and the UK and GDP growth going back to 2000. And if you look at the US, we had a great time in terms of housing prices. In the UK, we had an even better time. Now let me tell you the true stories in the US. The US, these stories I can't even make up because it's just the absolute craziness. So in the US, we now are doing retrospective analysis. In 2005, 2006, at the peak of the bubble, over half of all mortgages issued in the United States didn't have loan documentation attached to it. A third of all mortgages issued in the United States were alte or subprime in many metropolitan areas. Now you gotta picture how crazy this is. I got my first mortgage in 1986. My wife and I, it took us 100 days to get this mortgage. We put 30% down. We signed 118 forms, 114 of which I still do not understand. I'm sure one of those forms committed us to give up our eldest son if we chose not to pay off the mortgage. But then you fast forward 20 years later, and all those rules had gone out the window. The average size of a new home built in the United States in 2006 was 2,500 square feet. The average population size, household size in the US is 2.3 people. We're building over 1,000 square foot per person. In the United States, I always make this statement because it's powerful, there are rooms in our homes we do not visit. In the United States, if you were to walk into your living room as a man, your wife would kill you. It is not a living room, it is a shrine. And is seated, it's true, we have white carpeting and beige furniture. If I were to walk into my living room, my wife would kick me out. You're not allowed. But that was the craziness of the excesses. I once owned a house with seven bathrooms. I have two sons, my, sal, my wife, a Jack Russell Terrier dog, and we had seven bathrooms. Why? Because we could. That was the insanity of this. We saw the same thing in the UK, we saw the same thing in Spain, we saw the same thing in Ireland. And on top of that, think about what households were doing as well. Other purchases, unsecured debt, auto loans, my old sector of automotive, we had a great time there as well. At GM, we saw our transaction prices on vehicles go up 40% in 10 years, buying big SUVs and luxury cars. The average monthly payment went up 86 cents. How could you run up the transaction price by 40% and the average monthly payment go unchanged? Well, what did we do? We got really creative. 60-month loans, 72-month loans, 84-month loans, 96-month loans, 108-month loans. We subvented leasing, and you wonder why we went bankrupt. That's the craziness of the environment. And for us, against this pattern of rapid home prices and debt, and all the imbalances that went along with it, it made for a fragile backdrop. And any shock to that economic backdrop would show the vulnerabilities of where we're at. So it's not a surprise with regards to the severity of the downturn. It's not a surprise for how long the recovery process has been because those imbalances are very severe. Then you couple on top of this, the public sector is equally as a big a mess. State and local governments, national governments, all of those entities saw a very substantial run up in debt or unfunded liabilities, whether it be pension or health care. So, an interesting cycle, absolutely. And if you're wondering about what this has meant for all the developed economies, let me just show you where we were in 2007 and the fact that most developed economies are trying to get to their pre downturn levels. You got to pause for a moment. The downturn technically ended almost five years ago. Now just pause for a moment and reflect upon that. The downturn ended almost five years ago. 2009, second quarter, is when the downturn was officially declared over 
and that the recovery began. And yet five years into this healing process, soon to be five years, we're just now getting back to pre-downturn levels of output. Tough, absolutely. And once again, my setup today is to remind us just how challenging this operating environment is. And as I'll talk about, our customers, not surprisingly, increasingly come to us and say, help me find ways to grow. Help me find ways to optimize my business. Help me find ways to deepen my customer relationships and gain market share. Now more than ever, because of this backdrop, you better do those things. Now more than ever, it's critically important to find those opportunities in an efficient way. A few other things going on globally just to add into the complexity. One is the fact that this dramatic shift in emerging markets has in this current environment, and probably for the next few years, a series of wrinkles associated with it. Now don't get me wrong, we expect this trend to continue. The shift from emerging markets accounting for a fifth of global output to 40% and soon to be on 40% is going to continue. These are long-term patterns. So if you are engaged in global commerce, focusing on emerging markets and parts of the world that you haven't traditionally focused on is critically important. My message today, though, in terms of headwinds is that emerging markets will probably not grow either homogeneously or in a straight line in the next few years. The reason being is that there are all sorts of twists and turns playing out there. One twist and turn that's dominating the headlines right now is the fact that we've had a rapid inflow of capital and hot money into many of these markets as an unintended consequence of what the Bank of England, the ECB, and the Fed, and the Bank of Japan have done. Monetary policy was set with domestic considerations in mind, but it has global implications because capital is mobile, extremely mobile. And guess what? Many of these markets have seen a very strong surge in private sector debt, asset prices, some cases housing, other sectoral elements building up. And now what are we seeing every day? Well, crisis with the Turkish lira, the South African rand. Question marks over what their central banks would do. Can you imagine being the head of the Turkish central bank this morning? You got seven and a half percent retail inflation, you got to run on your currency, you're going to have to jack up rates to stabilize the market, all the while you've got political, social turmoil and an economy that is stalling. Doesn't make you too popular. You might want to have your next policy meeting in like London or something. That's being replicated in emerging markets around the globe right now, those types of discussions. On top of that, we shouldn't underestimate the fact that this vulnerability, while we point out, as we call it in our economic outlook right now, our bubble A5, there are a whole bunch of other markets that aren't that far away from the bubble A5 with regards to our short-term risk indicators we've pulled together on those markets. Some of these markets being of critical importance, market like Mexico, for instance, an emerging market that's usually at the top of the list like Chile. Those markets have question marks as well because of the flow of capital and the domestic policy issues they're going to have to wrestle with. Beyond those issues, you also have some long-term structural drivers. So we've spent quite a bit of time looking at the long-term development elements for any emerging market that's of significance. And against those four components of human capital, competitiveness, global openness, and where they're going from a policy standpoint, you can pull together a very interesting ranking. I would note any market on this side of the ledger has very tough structural issues that have to be dealt with. And that includes some big hitters like India. Coming off the election, will the next government, let's assume it's the BJP in power, will the BJP have the wherewithal to implement the next round of needed structural reforms? And without those structural reforms, your short-term financial pressures become that much more acute. It is a fun time for sure. Now, to make sure I'm not completely depressing you out of the gate, let me give you some grounds for optimism. The optimism that we're looking at in developed markets, and I just have snapshots of the US in this case, really stems from the fact that the healing process is moving forward. And that as we look at performance in terms of balance sheet health and delinquency and payments and charge-offs and write-offs, 
that there has been a dramatic improvement and a dramatic restructuring in the private sector. We see this in terms of the drop in those performance, but we also see this manifesting itself in some other positive elements, such as business failures. And this is showing up in other developed markets as well. This is the yin and the yang of balancing the current economic environment. Question marks regarding central banking policy, concerns over some emerging markets being offset by the fact that the healing process in the developed markets, the US, the UK, Germany at the top of that list, has made progress and we shouldn't underestimate it. It's a yin and a yang. It's a conflicted outlook is the best way I can describe it. My optimism is this pattern will continue. It will support a more virtuous cycle towards the tail end the back half of this decade, and if we can get the emerging market issues behind us and structural reform is renewed and the central banks of the United States, UK, and the ECB sort out their direction from an exit strategy, we'll be in good shape. Now, what does that mean for Europe? Well, in Europe, it has been certainly a challenging environment. Again, we talk about the unique cycle during this period of time. It was severe, as severe as we saw in other parts of the globe. The additional challenge in Europe, of course, was a secondary contraction in parts of the Eurozone. And you've lived it, you've experienced it. You don't have a reference point historically. There's nobody in this room that's lived through this. I'm hoping that we never live through it again. I will give you some grounds for optimism because we are beginning to see not only the Northern European economies who have outperformed the Southern European economies but we are starting to see the southern European economies move back into a growth mode. We don't think it'll be a sprint. This chart gives you the illusion that, oh my goodness, good times are here again. I just point out for you that's 2% growth, not 4% growth. But we are increasingly confident that those markets will put the worst behind them. And as we look at 2015 and 2016, it will start to feel like a recovery. It will still require you to be very targeted, surgical, efficient, effective, all of those things going along with it. But we'll take 2% growth over the last couple of years of contractionary economic activity. And if you couple this with improvements in the US, it does set us up that the major developed economies in the world will become more of an engine of growth and should be able to offset some sluggishness and some pressure points playing out in emerging markets. So an interesting time. Here's our forecast. Keep your fingers crossed. We're underestimating. We're right now assuming that the UK will actually beat this forecast. We're in the process of upgrading our forecast for the UK. Uh, but in general, let's call it 25 to 3% growth. And hopefully improvement as we get through the middle to latter stages of the decade. I always inject my caveat and my safe harbor language at this point saying there are still these big risks and unknowns we're going to have to grapple with. Uh, as we look at the next few years. But having said that, if I were to bet right now, I would bet that this forecast and maybe slightly better than this forecast will play out, which should help you from a planning standpoint in terms of your business. All right, so let me pause there and take questions and thoughts. Again, we want this to be interactive about what we're seeing from an economic standpoint, other questions I can help you with in terms of issues you're dealing with in terms of your individual businesses. Anything on your mind, please just Stand up, shout it out. Don't be shy. Don't make me call on you, because I will. I'm an ex-teacher, so I've done that a few times in my life. Please. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Chris Lezikowski from SIG. Very nice my, to meet you. Good morning. Um, very interesting analysis of what's been going on in the past, recent past, and further behind that as well. How confident are you in the models that are being developed now about predicting what's going to happen in even the relatively short term, given the uh, rather obvious lack of success sure. in previous models? I think it's a great question. Um, one of the things we've done at DNB is we've tried to couple macro modeling and macro analysis with micro insights. You know, historically, macro models have been very dependent on, on being rear view, mirror looking, policy assumptions for any of you that, that went through any type of economics training. We'd all talk about our, our ISLM models, right? And that's, so you can tell how old I am. For all of my youngsters on my staff in the room, yes, they'll remind me all the time. But uh, the problem with those macro models is when you have a cycle like this cycle with all of the structural imbalances and other elements, 
um, they have been inaccurate. If you look at the Fed's forecast, for instance, the Fed's been wildly optimistic and has missed the mark. Uh, for us, what we've been focusing on is that we track activity on all active businesses. So we have our fingers on the pulse, and I'm going to go in detail today on what we're now doing with those signals, those health measures. And what we're focused on is taking those insights and linking them back up to our macro models and our macro forecasts to make sure that there's corroborating evidence. So I feel very good about our forecast because we're doing that, and we're the first people to ever really try to do that. Uh, having said that, I, I think there's two things to keep in mind. The speed of the healing process could surprise us on the upside. So we're seeing it's pretty rapid right now, and that could help in business investment could take off. And then the second caveat, which is always the economist's creed of saying, there's these unknowns out here, so you've got to be ready for them. So I feel better about our forecast. I'm, I'm also very proud that our forecast over the last few years has been very good uh, because we've been more hesitant because we've been worried about how fast the healing process would be. Um, having said that, staying on top of these potential risks is critically important. By the way, at the end, one of the things I'm going to mention is that every month now we're providing an update for all of our customers on our perspective on what's going on with our leading indicators. So we offer that to you. It's just a 30-minute, feel free to call in, and we'll give you an update because we're trying to keep our fingers on the pulse. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed. That's right. My old colleagues at the Fed, uh, I used to uh, be the coordinator for the macroeconomic forecasting process. And to tell you the truth, I'm glad I wasn't there the last few years because uh, it's been pretty challenging. Other questions, please? Anybody else? Yes, please. We're going to hand you a mic if you don't mind. Or, or if you can speak loudly, just shout. It was more a question. You, you made the comment about Apple. <clears throat> yes. Do you um, provide insight into uh, you know, global cust uh, companies which are um, Teeter, that may fail, not fail, but actually in terms of where their, where their performance is going to go. And do you think that the, um, the poor performance of the rating agencies during this whole performance has actually uh, colored people's views of external agencies' views on companies' future keep, um, performance? Absolutely. So it's a great question, and you're going to set me up for my second half of my remarks today. Uh, one of the things that we're focused on is to provide a holistic analysis of companies that is forward-looking. Historically, what we've done and other people have done is, is we've built models around whether or not you're going to pay your bills on time or whether or not there is this very rare occurrence that we would call failure, which is an outright declaration of bankruptcy or so on. We've gone well beyond that in terms of our analytic capabilities, and we're leveraging what we've done in the States to develop the same capabilities for European country, countries, companies this year, uh, building new analytic tools so you have that integrated foresight. So one of the things I'm going to show you today is what's called the viability rating. It's our first multi-dimensional view of the future likelihood that a business will be operating relative to other businesses 12 months from now. And when you bring that entire view together, we believe that it provides the, the best way to evaluate companies on a relative basis. Uh, it just historically hasn't been done as systematically as it needed to because you're trying to make decisions on, on how to optimize. And part of those decisions are you want as much of a holistic view of a business entity as possible. And it's not just one dimension. Whether or not they're paying their bills on time is one dimension. So we're bringing in other dimensions into that equation. So when you're evaluating company A versus company B versus company C, you can have more of that complete picture. It's a very, very good question. With regards to the rating agencies, uh, you know, the rating agencies are, play an interesting role. And my time at GM, I, one of the roles I had was I was the interface point with the rating agencies. And every, every six months when I had to go through my four-hour review with each one of them individually, it was about as much enjoyment as having a root canal without Novocaine uh, because they do rip you apart and they do go deep. Um, the challenge for the rating agencies is it's, it's very much a, a static view and it's very much a retrospective view. It's about looking at elements and financial indicators that are in many cases are, are rear view looking. And that's a real challenge for them. And, and certainly our commitment is to be force and oriented towards foresight or forward looking. So I wouldn't criticize them in the sense that they were doing their traditional job. I would say that our job, as well as anybody else that does this for a living, has to be very much about foresight, very much about where things are heading. 
And if you just use traditional measures, it's very hard to do that, which is, again, why we've built other measures to augment our modeling capabilities. And I'll walk you through a series of things that we've done today. Great question. Any other questions? All right, so let me challenge you on a couple other things to keep the fun dialogue going. By the way, from an economic standpoint, let's try to be optimistic today. Our goal is to, this too will get better. I will remind us that the 1930s eventually passed and 1980s, the early 80s passed. I understand lots of suffering going on, um, but keep our fingers crossed. I think the back end of the decade will set us up for stronger growth. A few other things to, to challenge your thinking, to set up the discussion of around that last question, and that is, it would be one thing if we're only dealing with the economy. The challenge we have is that on top of what's going on cyclically, we have structural changes underway that are accelerating very rapidly. And I want to show you a picture to set this up and explain why we underestimate and why we don't always get our arms around what's going on structurally. So for those of you in the back, this may be a little hard to see. It's a picture of the Vatican Square at Pope Benedict's inauguration only eight years ago, just over eight years ago. If you really look at this picture, what's extraordinary about this picture is you see one flip phone. One flip phone. Now, if you fast forward eight years later to Pope Francis, look what you see. Now, let me challenge your thinking a little bit more before we get into what this means in terms of data and information. Let me just challenge your thinking to go back eight years earlier than this and realize that if we go back from 2005 to 1997, every day there were less than 20 million Internet users a day, as recently as 1995. Let me take you back eight years earlier than that and reveal to you that it was only eight years earlier than that that the Federal Reserve introduced its first website. We gave it a name, Kimberly, to encourage people to use it. It was on the World Wide Network. Remember that? You used to click on it. It sounded like somebody was drowning a cat because you were hooked into a landline. This little globe would spin around. And you'd go to the Fed website and you would get six time series. Woohoo! And you pull them into your Lotus 123 spreadsheet. Think about each quantum leap during that phase. So, in those eight year increments, we went from the Fed having a website with six time series. We then jump up to the fact that we're up to close to 20 million internet users a day. You then fast forward to where we're at with the inauguration of Pope Benedict, where we all were using the internet every day. And then you jump forward into 2013. Now, I would challenge you to think about what 2013 really means in terms of information flow and sharing of information. And all of these questions are very profound. What happens now to our ability to acquire information, share information, distribute information, how social networks are functioning? It's dramatic. Anybody in this room not have your smartphone with you today? No, you wouldn't go anywhere without it. I tell the story of my wife being on vacation where my wife is the historian of the family. So any vacation or any event, she has her camera with her. We go to our home in northern Michigan last summer. We go to our famous, our favorite picturesque spot in northern Michigan. And I know she's going to take her normal photos. And it just dawned on me she didn't bring her camera on the trip. She pulled out her iPhone, went click, 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 click. She's taking pictures, and she's instantaneously sharing those pictures with everybody that she could. It's a big change. I think oftentimes we underestimate what goes on structurally because we have our reference points rooted today and in the past. We shouldn't underestimate this. And we shouldn't underestimate what this is going to continue to mean because the downturn of 2008, 2009 is intensifying the acceleration of technological change. We all talk about business investment lagging in this recovery. One component in business investments actually higher than it was pre-downturn, and that's research and development spending. Research and development spending continues to go up. Now, for us, in terms of what we do and try to help you make better decisions, this transforms everything. And, of course, we talk about the sexiness of big data. Now, I want to be clear at the outset that the issues we're trying to solve for are not different. And what we do for a living and what we try to help you with and what you try to do for a living, you're still trying to 
answer those same business questions. Who are my commercial relationships? Who should I sell to? How should I improve my marketing effectiveness? How do I deepen customer relationship? How am I performing versus a competition? Am I gaining market share? Is the lever I'm pulling over here having the desired outcomes? I spent a lot of time helping CEOs try to answer those questions. Same basic questions. But the environment we live in is different because the precision and speed by which the answers have to come has gone way up. 